Okay, now we're in our second increment and we're dealing with the second clause, hypostasis pragmaton, which is right here. Hypostasis, that's going to be the main focus of this increment, and pragmaton. Okay? That's what we're going to cover in this increment. The thoughtless translation of hypostasis and I do mean thoughtless, and you'll know in a minute why I say that, is to call it substance, the reality, the underlying reality behind anything. See, this is Freiburg. Underlying reality. And Bauer Danker's going to come up with the essential or basic structure, a substantial nature, essence, actual being, reality. Okay? If you're not paying attention to the book and what the writer is saying in the book, and you're not paying any attention to church history and how the word hypostasis is used, yeah, you're going to make the mistake of, of, of saying it's basic structure of reality when you're in a hurry and translating and you've got candle wax. You know, because the King James translators were in a hurry. All right? They'll just write down the first thing that comes to mind. It's an understandable mistake. What is not forgivable, well, it's forgivable, but it should be fixed, is that after 400 years, we're still not understanding how wrong we are to translate that word, hypostasis, as substance. Because looky here, baby. Oh, my. What do we see here? Hypostasis. And where is it? Hebrews 1 3. And what is it talking about? Oh, it's talking about Christ. He's the radiance of Father's glory and what? The character, the exact representation of Father's nature. And what is Father's nature in the Greek? Hypostasis. Uh oh. Uh oh. Christ is being called the hypostasis. Yeah, and don't we all know that in theology? What do we call his nature? The God man hypostatic union. You ever heard of that term? Yeah, and why do we say that? Well, what is a hypostasis? Literally, Hypostasis, hupo means under, and sta stasis means standing. So it's understanding. It means literally in our English would be standing under. One nation, one nature, his humanity, standing under another nature, his deity. Okay? That's why it has this connotation of underlying, the substantial nature. Okay, so the nickname, nickname of Jesus the Christ in the book of Hebrews established right here is that he is the substantial nature of the Father. The exact representation character, that's this word right here, of who? The Father. Okay, so this is a nickname for the deity and humanity in one person of who? Jesus Christ. It is not substance in the generic sense. Okay, you got that, right? Hopefully you got that. See, in any kind of writing, you can take a word like dog, and like in English, if you wanted to mean a specific dog without mentioning the dog's name, you might capitalize dog or you might say something about dog. And whenever you're referring to dog again in the same context, everybody knows you mean the same dog. You got that? Christ. Upostaseus. Hypostasis. Now, this couldn't be more famous in understanding. In Greek, what do you want to call it? It's not quite Catholicism, but in Greek Christianity, 
they had this saying about, you know, usia trace. I'm not trying to say the Greek right right now. And high school postesis, okay? One who postesis Christ, three persons, three usia. All right? That's what that's a famous saying in Greek Christianity and in theology. So what did all the brains turn off when they were translating this? Because you know we're talking about copying the King James translation. They knew about all this stuff because Greek Christianity came up with that saying in like what the, the 200s A.D. So what did the brains all forget about that saying? One hypostasis, one mediator. That's second. Uh, that's in Timothy 2:15. See, it's a nickname for Christ. It is not the generic term for substance or assurance or underlying reality. Well, I mean, he's the underlying reality of everybody's life. Yeah, in a sense. Then you'd have to capitalize it and call it the reality, the substance, the dog. You see what I'm trying to get at here? This is a rhetorical device used by the writer of Hebrews. And, oh, is Brain out just making that up? Uh, no, I just gave you reasons why you can know that. And you'll notice on the right-hand side of the screen, he's using the term again. Well, is there anywhere else he uses it? Oh, yeah. Hebrews 3, verse 14. Ah, ooh, partakers of Christ? Ah, yeah. Doing what? Tain arcin te suposta seus metri. Until the end. Ah, holding firm from the beginning our what? See, he's using it as a nickname. He's using this in that position. How do you hold firm and assurance? You can't. But if you were to capitalize assurance, substance, reality, in apposition to Christu, which is also in the genitive, hello, then you would know again that the writer is drawing a parallel between Christ, the exact nature we saw in Hebrews 1.3. He's reminding the reader that the reality is Christ. It's a nickname for Christ. You hold to what? You hold to Christ. Because why? Because we're metokoi. We're partakers. See, if you're a part, if this can't be too hard. If you're sharing in something, if you're partaking in something, that means your hands are partaking. Your hands are touching the thing you're partaking of. And what are you a partaker of? To Christu, hello, who is what? The hypostasus, hypostasus here. Do you see the parallel? Could it be more obvious? This is the second time he's done this between Christ and hypostasis. So are you surprised that here in Hebrews 11, 1, he's doing it again? Now, he doesn't have to say Christ a third time. He's saying hypostasis is a third time. So when you're looking at this, hypostasis, you should read that as Christ, the substance, the reality of our life, just like Hebrews 3.14 says, right there on the left-hand side. Duh! It has a special usage in the book of Hebrews. Why didn't the translators pick up on that? Well, probably because their wives were yelling at them, or the candle wax was melting, or they were hot, or tired. You know, we're all human. But why do we make this mistake for 400 years now? When this is one of the most famous terms in theology. We all know it stands for Christ. So why aren't we using it for his name right here in Hebrews 11? 1? Okay? Then we come to our next word, pragmaton, a pragma. A pragma 
is a technical term for uh, a lawsuit. Okay? It has a generalistic term. All right? And then it has another generalistic term, occupation. Okay? But it's most especially used in law for a matter before the court. Okay? And how do we know that it's used that way versus the other two ways? Because if you will look at the entire chapter of Hebrews 11, it's about people being put on trial for having confidence in the Word of God. The entire chapter is about that, which you can tell even in English translation. So this should be translated Christ, hypostasis, nickname, the exact nature of Christ, and this is literally of the trials. Christ of the trials. Christ of the trial matters. I prefer the better, you know, English idiom would be Christ on trial. Christ on trials, literally plural. And that's the next point I need to make. This is by people. People have confident expectations, not things. This is plur genitive plural, objective genitive plural, and the object of the confident expectations is what? The Word of God, the contract, the Bible. And what is Christ's other nickname in the Bible? The Word of God, who became flesh and dealt, dwelt among us. The Word of God, who became the way, the truth, and the life. Already established twice, previously in Hebrews, using the same word, hypostasis, as Christ himself in the flesh. So, he is the faith. The content of what we believe is Christ. He is the hypostasis, the exact underlying reality of God, the exactness of God. He's God himself. You see the point? So, this, too, is an objective genitive. He's the subject of the trial, but the trials, pragmaton, plural, trial matters, trial lawsuits, are also genitive plural and also objective genitive because he is the trial matter. He is the subject of the trial, therefore the object of all the trials that are filed. You see the point? When you're the subject of the trial, you're the one on trial, therefore you're the object of the trial. And if you want to get really fancy, you could say this is a plenary genitive. You've got objective genitive, subjective genitive, and plenary genitive. And the beauty of Greek is that the, the meaning in the verse lends itself to all three uses. But it's not considered good Greek if you use all three uses. You have to pick one. Okay, well, which one do you pick? Well, confident believings have to have an object. That object is pistis. Notice how on the other side of that object is hypostasis. But in proper Greek, you're putting the object of the belief first as a subject. Now notice something else. Pistis. Nominative case. Okay is in apposition to the second clause, hypostasis, pistis, hypostasis. You got that? The Greek doesn't, isn't keen on, you know, rhyming sounds. I mean, sometimes it is. That's, you know, whether the writer intended that or not, I don't know if I go that far. But the endings are the same here and here. And objective genitive, because he's the topic of the trial. He's the one who's on trial. And he is in opposition to pistis. You see that? This is the first clause. Pistis al pisomeno. Second clause. Opostasis pragmaton. It's in opposition. It's tic-tac-toe. You basically are supposed to take this as your first clause listed on a sheet of paper as point one. Point two underneath point one in parallelism is hypostasis pragmaton, Christ of the trials. 
Christ on trials, Christ the substance of reality of the trials, Christ the substance of the trials, Christ who's in apposition to what? The content of what we believe, a.k.a. the Word. You see? So, it's about Word confidently believed, Clause 1. Christ on trials, in trials. Trials of who? Are, we're the ones being tried about him. So, if we're being tried about him, and he and this Hupostas is his nickname, and it's an apposition to Pistis, then it's his word on trial in us. So I translate this part here, Christ thinking on trial. Because Hebrews 11, 6 is going to say, without pistis, without the word in you confidently believed, it is impossible to please God. So Christ's word is the word, is the Bible in your head on trial. See how easy that is to understand? Can you think of one denomination on the planet that would disagree with that? It doesn't, it doesn't disagree with anybody's interpretation. This is pan-denominational. The one thing everybody in Christendom agrees is that the Bible is the Word of God. Okay, well, there you go. In the next increment, I'll cover the last and simplest clause that's also in apposition. Ella kosu blepomenon.